Um, do you think we will ever see Intel allow overclocking on non-K CPUs? Uh, what do you think it would take for them to do it? Um, I think it's certainly possible. It, well, it was possible once upon, once upon a time or once upon a time. <laughs> I think it's once upon a time. <laughs> uh, I'll Google it later <laughs> to make sure. Uh, <laughs> I think we will see it uh, if things keep heading in the direction there, if they keep getting pressured heavily by AMD. Having said all of that, I don't really care. Like, oh, well, I guess it means you can buy the lower end parts. Like, you know, for example, with Ryzen, we've always said don't buy the X model, save the whatever it was. Usually at launch, it's what, like $50 to get yep. the non-X model. So it'd be don't buy the K SKU, buy the non-K and save $50 or whatever. Yeah, I think we will see it and I think it would be worth it. So yeah, I mean these days overclocking on these CPUs is not it's a significant factor. I mean, especially in the on the case where they're already clocked very high. I guess it's more about getting those lower clock parts and seeing can you clock them up to the level. Like say for example, you buy an eleven seven hundred, can you increase like the all core frequency to see out of the box though? I guess this is where I was going, and I sort of backed out of it because there's so many angles to discuss, but. The 11700, for example, out of the box delivers a basically identical performance to the K model because you're talking about like a percent or two difference in yep. frequency. Don't know exactly what it is, but it's very low like that. So, yeah, uh, they've been benchmarked side by side and the results are virtually identical. Obviously, with the K skew, you can maybe what 5% maybe, more out of it or something. If you're lucky. So it doesn't really make much difference. If they had like the old days in the, the core two duo days, you could get like a really cheaper lower end part because the product stack was so heavily segmented and then overclock that to match the high end part. So you could buy like a $200 CPU and get like six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 CPU performance or whatever it may be. But yeah, basically I think they possibly will do it and... Mm. I don't really care. I can see Intel consolidating the lineup from what they've currently got. You know, each each CPU basically has like the K model, then the K model with no graphics, so the KF. Then they've got a non-K, non-F, and then a non-K but F model. Yeah. I think a lot of that could be consolidated. So you might see, for example, a slightly higher binned version that becomes the K model with overclocking and the enabled iGPU, and then potentially the there's only one other model available that's a little bit lower binned. Still, you can overclock it, but it has the iGPU disabled. And then that would sort of present maybe a more sensible level of segmentation. So there's not 100 CPUs. They cut it down to like yeah. one or two per, per core count. Again, it also depends in the future when they move to a new node, what's the difference between the best yeah. bins and the, the least good bins. That will depend a lot on this as well. Yeah. And potentially, maybe then it makes more sense to enable overclocking. So... If the bins, you know, some bins may be slightly better than the others. So, yeah, I think with 10th and 11th gen, it wouldn't have made much difference. It wouldn't have changed our recommendations or how excited we got about certain CPUs. I think the lock parts are just fine, uh, especially when you run them without power limits on, you know, most of the Z series motherboards or Z series, depending yep. on where you come from. Definitely Z series. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> the comment section can't handle yep. that kind of flack. Uh, I think the biggest difference really was the memory support yes, because absolutely. the jet X spec is so low and obviously we're going to see the same thing with ddr5 it'll start somewhere and then a couple of years down the track it'll get you know yep. higher frequency better timings and stuff like that so 2666 did limit cpu bound performance quite yep. a bit and then you get you know lower latency 3200 3600 even 3800 now um and that can yield quite impressive performance uplifts and that's probably more beneficial for locked parts than adding 300 megahertz to the frequency. Yeah, the difference between it running at JetX CL22 as opposed to yeah. CL16, even at the same frequency like DDR4 3200. Yeah. yeah. It's a big difference. Yeah I, don't, yeah, I think that you could still tune the timings, but obviously it was the frequency yeah. cap. Um, but you had to be a bit more knowledgeable, I suppose. To yeah. Timings can be a real mess because even if basically just validating it for stability and whatnot can be a pain in the butt. Yep. So you think it's all good, then you go to encode a video or something and it gets to 50% and then <laughs> blue screens and you don't know yeah. why. And uh, so that's why memory timings, yeah, I don't do, I don't push the tuning angle too much. Yep. Um, and I definitely don't test with tune timings because, yeah, because of those reasons. 